No way, Jose. The following footage proves beyond any doubt that the tanks intentionally set the house on fire. It proves that the Branch Davidians were murdered. You can see that this tank has a gas jet on the front that shoots fire. You can also see the fire quite plainly. The tank goes into the house twice, and each time as it backs out, the fire at the gas jets is plainly visible. We must all do more to recognize and look for the early warning signals that deeply troubled young people send. Hey, what's up, guys? It's Jose Galison. You're watching No Way Jose. Uh, today, I have Amy Lapore on with me. Uh, we're taking a little blast from the past, going to old school Jose, uh, a little more theory, less parapolitics. Uh, but, uh, I don't know, this was kind of like real life, and, uh, it was, it's topical, uh, but yeah, we're kind of covering, like, emergency management, hurricanes, you know, all that stuff that's been going on lately with Helene and Milton, it just, uh, and obviously it directly affected me, for those who follow this channel, you know that, uh, it definitely affected me a lot, lost, uh, power for, uh, about, like, half a week, you know, lost some work, but, you know, all in all, not that bad, but it just, still, a lot of people were interested in what's going on, a lot of people weren't as lucky, so it uh, makes for an interesting topic, and uh, it also makes for an interesting topic in the perspective of, like, how would we handle this better? Uh, how would this ideally be handled in, a, in a, the ideal, you know, economy or whatever? Well, how would this be handled? Uh, you know, kind of like I said, old school theory, Jose. So that's kind of what we'll be talking about a lot today. But before we get into it, I do want to let you guys know that today's episode is brought to you by Nado Shave Co. You guys know I love these guys. Uh, if you're tired of that razor burn, that irritation, that nonsense you get from those multi-blade cartridges, this is where you need to go. You can return the traditional shave. You don't need the expensive nonsense. You can shave just like your grandpa used to. Uh, whether you're doing your whole face or just edging up your beard, this is the way to go. Uh, I mean, I, it is great to have a product like this. I, I do dig it a lot. Like you guys see, I, I, you know, every now and then I edge it up my shit. It's always using the dough. Uh, I really did waste many years with those multi-blade, uh, multi-blade nonsense. But once you try this, you do realize that like, Hey, you really only just need one razor. Uh, that's the way to go. It's better for your skin overall. It's cheaper. It's 75 bucks for an entire year. And let's, let's be real. You're going to make that last a lot longer. That's what the standard issued comes with. It comes with a hundred stainless steel, uh, razor blades that's the 75 bucks but if you do shave regularly like every single day uh you might want to check out the quarter shave club that's about 25 cents per blade but i mean if you think about how much you're spending on those uh those multi-blade ones i mean you're spending probably at least double that throughout the year and jacking your face up so don't do that go back go back the way you used to the you know we used to shave uh, also, it's a COVID mandate refusing company. I like to bring that up. Uh, NadeauShaveCo.com. Use Jose at checkout for 10% off your entire order. But all right, guys, let's go ahead and get a Amy in here and get into it. What's up, Amy? How you doing? Hey, Jose. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. Uh, I mean, we've I think we've been uh, you know, mutuals for a long time now. I've seen you around here and there. Um, I just never, I mean, I don't know, I, I just, we hadn't really talked too much. Uh, I've always been interested in you and your husband's content that I see you guys put out. So it's cool to have you here. It is just kind of weird, uh, serendipitous that stars aligned. I didn't realize you had this extensive background in this very specific niche of emergency management. Uh, but yeah, I guess if you want to let my audience know kind of like what your background is, uh, I guess also kind of maybe know about your, your libertarian credentials. Cause I know that, uh, uh, that, that probably has a lot of, you know, tie in with my audience. Uh, I mean, I'm not really a party person, but I mean, I think we are probably very, very similar souls. I know you're of the Mises crowd. Uh, I mean, I'm not like one who believes necessarily, and I'm not a big believer in political, uh, you know, in the political process. 
But, you know, so far as those who are, the Mises Caucus are my people, so generally speaking. So I, I think we'll probably be simpatico in a lot of ways. But I just let, let, let people know about your, you, what you're up to, that kind of stuff. You got it, Jose. So it's good to see you. It's good to, <laughs> good to meet you. Uh, and I guess the, with respect to the reason we're talking tonight, I do have a background in emergency management. I served as an emergency manager at the county level for about a decade and a half, uh, and also as the president of the Maryland Emergency Management Association. So when, when the, the, the storm down south occurred and we saw what happened with FEMA, have been uh, a little more active on social media, have written a couple of articles, uh, done a couple of podcasts, and I'm, I'm excited to talk about it with you more tonight. So thank you. Um, I studied public policy uh, as, in grad school at the University of Delaware, and, and in, because of what I saw in my own career, took a look at, uh, during my dissertation studies, local emergency management and its response to the billions of federal dollars from FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security. And I suppose we'll probably dig into that a little bit tonight. Mm -hmm. and I've worked in and around the Libertarian Party and the Mises Caucus for a number of years as well. Uh, right now, right now my, my volunteer time is dedicated to the Defend the Guard effort. Um, working as kind of a volunteer for them, championing the cause not only here uh, in Maryland, but also helping with any state that, that needs help. There are so many volunteers out there that help with phone banking, and I'm, I'm just one of them. And right now, I uh, have a little bit of a side project. You might have seen we have Dissident Media on Twitter. We are at Dissident Media, uh, and that's going to that's gonna grow. That's fledgling at this point. Uh, we're a startup, um, but we, you know our, our goal is to operate in the liberty space, and I think you'll see us roll out a series of creators um, that are a broad swath of creators. We're not just looking at libertarians. This is not a, a libertarian effort. This is a, a liberty movement effort. You're good on COVID, good on war. You're probably somebody who, who can get down with us, right? Like you're probably a content creator we can bring on. And our model, our goal is to be the most, um, the most empowering, the most um, accessible to content creators, the most uh, available to them in terms of what gives them creative freedom. So that's the dissident model. And we'll, you'll see that roll out more after the first of the year. Yeah, I'm really interested to see where the dissident thing goes, because honestly, this is actually what started this. I saw you were on Matt Kibbe recently, and so many might be inclined to think like, oh, I just saw you in a big show, then I hit you up. Uh, no, I actually had hit you up before then, then it got a little bit delayed due to my circumstances with the hurricane. Uh, but I actually read a me an article you wrote on dissident media, on the Twitter account at least. Uh, you, you put it out on that platform. And that was the first, I, I feel like I actually had seen it like once or twice prior to that, just kind of... And it's got a pretty good following already, so it just kind of, I guess I just, maybe I just wasn't paying attention, just blew up out of nowhere, uh, but in, because you guys actually haven't technically started, or maybe you sort of have in a certain sense, depending on what you mean with it. So I don't know, I'm interested to see what you guys are going to do with that, uh, but it was a good article, that's kind of what got the gears turning in my head, I'm like, oh, kind of would like to cover it, because this is one of those, this is, uh, you know, emergencies like this are kind of in the realm of what you know say libertarians or anarchists or whatever would be like this is the only reason justifiable reasons for government that and like then an ironically something like a uh, i don't know a pandemic or something which i mean obviously we you know we kind of that you know but a few years of that has destroyed the idea that a government is of any use there uh but um it is kind of when it comes to emergencies we are like if there is a purpose for government wouldn't this be it uh, I do I do lean towards the anarchist perspective that obviously if you can somehow create a system that's free of coercion, it's going to be more efficient and, and work better anyways. Uh, now, how does that work with something like this? Uh, I mean, obviously, this is like probably the type of stuff that you would uh, see a David Friedman uh, essay on or something along these lines. So it, it is, uh, I don't know, it's an interesting topic. So I am, I'm looking forward to digging into it. Um, but yeah, tell me a little bit about, before we get into it, like we got a little bit of time, I do want to hear about what what is this, the deal with Dissident Media? I was impressed with the article. I, 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 mean, I, I like the, the little bit I've heard. I heard you talk about it on, on Matt's show. I listened to your uh, interview with Matt Kibbe. Uh, I forget what his show is called. Sorry, Matt. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, t tell me a little bit more about that. What, what's, what's the plan with that? Uh, I, I guess it just kind of surprised me. It's got pretty significant growth that came out of nowhere, and it hasn't even really technically started. So 
kind of promising uh, and I'm interested. And like I said, I, I saw, you know, a good article. I am familiar with your husband as well, which I'm sure is, uh, is involved. And I've been impressed with pretty much most anything you guys have touched. So I don't know, I'm kind of, I, I am interested where this goes. So I'm just curious if you could tell me and my audience a little bit more about what the deal is with that. You got it. And I'm an open book host. So let me, let me level with you. That account was taken from a board member. <laughs> so, okay. I thought maybe yeah. it was one of those where you, somebody yeah. took them like, how the hell did they get over 20 K like that? Like Jesus. So no, you're, you're super observant. Um, that, that account was taken from, actually that was Mike Heiss's old account. Oh, okay. And he, he, yeah. And, and so, so that account was taken from him in, in service of using it for the company instead, but we are growing like exponentially fast, even given that. So that's absolutely the case. So the business model looks kind of like this, rolling out social media, rolling out merchandise. Um, you might've seen today, we put some snapshots up of a studio. Uh, so we'll be rolling out um, some new shows, but we do have Dan Smotz and Dave Casey already on board and their show is a part of our network. They certainly are part of the, the business, kind of the creative side. God knows that's not, <laughs> that's not me. Um, so yeah, so I think it is a work in progress, uh, rolling out slowly and in the background, as you can imagine, right? Contracts and attorneys and things like this and, and negotiations, but we'll, we'll be bringing on content creators and I think after the first of the year, other than a couple of small shows will roll out, I think after the first of the year, we'll really start to hit our stride uh, and dissident media will will certainly grow. But for right now, it is a labor of love and and certainly and certainly very young. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm just trying to get a grip of what this even is trying to be. I'm assuming <laughs> it kind of like a almost like a Blaze Studios type thing or something mm -hmm. like that. Like that. Okay. All right. I, I just it, getting it a feel a for it. Yeah. You got it. So a network of creators will have a series of podcasts. Um, you know, our part of our role will be to place advertisers on those podcasts to to cut clips for for um, people who have podcasts to help with production uh, if they mm -hmm. need it, to help with uh, branding if they need it, to provide all of those services um, for for any of the creators who work with us. And then also, obviously, the you know building a stable of authors will have you know, articles coming out much more frequently than we do. I think right now we're one or two a week. Well, you know, that, that will certainly pick up the pace as well. Well, that's cool. I look forward to see where this goes. Uh, I, you know, I think it sounds promising to me. I mean, I know some of the people involved and so I don't think it'd be cool. Uh, but yeah, I guess let's, let's go ahead and let's just give a quick overview. I actually kind of would like you to give me an overview of, I guess more particularly kind of what happened with Helene. Cause I'll be honest, I was, and even, I guess, somewhat maybe with Milton, uh, I've been very hyper-focused on my local area and myself through all of this because it, you know, I wasn't really too worried about the internet, like kind of the national talks, because it's like, I know I'm dealing with real life stuff. I'm trying to make sure me and my family are safe, you know, ha healthy, happy. Uh, I wasn't too concerned with the, you know, I guess how other people were doing or where it was hitting, or I was more just concerned with, you know, uh, you know, batting up the hatches where I'm at, stuff like that, taking, making sure we have everything we need. So I did kind of tune out a lot of that type stuff aside from the hyper local type stuff, which we can go into. We talked a little bit before this, for those who aren't aware, uh, I'm kind of, uh, I'm in the Tampa area, uh, so I'm going to guess I kind of semi-dox myself a little bit, which I have before, whatever. I'm kind of in the Tampa area, I'm like, which is about where uh, Milton was supposed to exactly hit, but I think it ended up going about something like 100 miles south, um, and I'm probably about 10 miles inland in a rural area. So I'm far enough inland to where storm surges weren't a concern, but uh, wind is and um, flooding depending on where you're at. My property doesn't flood too bad. But anyways, just so you guys know where I'm at, what I'm dealing with, uh, I had everyone in the world thinking I'm going to die, uh, where, when in reality that's not really what happened. But if you could just guy, give a quick overview of those two for the audience to remind them as well, just kind of what what were we being told prior to each and what ended up happening? I know the little bit I paid attention with Helene, it was like a, a soft fart through Florida. It really wasn't anything I was really expecting way worse. <laughs> <laughs> but go go on. I'll, I'll pass the floor off to you. Yeah. So, so the lead up to Milton was much more had much more celebrity around it, right? The mm -hmm. the meteorologists were saying, "This is the the worst thing we've seen in a long time." We were going back and forth, I think, with Milton between a Category Three and a Category Four before it made landfall. I think there was meteorologists crying uh, at one point. 
Um, with, the, ma- with the mayor of Tampa said everyone everyone in the evacuation zones was going that if they stayed was going to die, which it, yes, which was insane to me because it's like yes. I mean I, to be fair I, I maybe she was speaking specifically in Tampa which the Tampa area is kind of like it if it had hit like it was supposed to it would have been basically underwater but I think she was talking I was in an evacuated county and I didn't evacuate because it's just like. I felt like I was more in tune with where my area and where I was at. Now, if I lived in trailer where I'm at, I would have evacuated. But I live in a you know a solid house, so I said, "Screw you, government! I'm not leaving." <laughs> uh, but yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. No, no. So that's exactly it. So so Milton was was um, really talked up the the days before it hit. Um, it certainly did not hit with the. Uh, with, with the ferociousness, I think that the meteorologist had 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 told you, uh, but there certainly was damage uh, mm. for, for Milton. I, think, I know people are are still recovering. I think there's still some power outages in Florida. I yeah. know there's been extensive damage. We have friends uh, in the Clearwater area with mm. with substantial damage in their neighborhoods. Yep. So I know that people are still recovering from that. Yeah, I so actually more- got power back fairly quickly, and that's probably the longest I've ever gone. I've been in this area for well over a decade, and that's the longest I've been without power from a hurricane, just for, okay. for context for people. So, yeah. And you've been hit with probably worse than Milton. Actually, I'd say, I don't know, I, I swear, I forget which one it was, but we definitely got hit with a four at one point. Uh, so that's part of why I'm not too concerned, because I, I know kind of what a, a, a small four looks like. Yeah. Uh, obviously more than that, I'm a little bit concerned, but I, I know I can handle a four. <laughs> so, and they, they were talking about a low four or a three the entire time. So I'm like, this is nothing. And then it really wasn't. But it, it did, it did, you know, knock out a lot of power in the area, the power, you know, gas. It really did a number on the like infrastructure. But so far as like safety, I mean, there were people, I did, there were trees that got capsized and stuff in some areas. So like, if you were really unlucky, uh, you mean, you know, it could have caused some real issues or been a safety hazard. But for the most part, it seemed like everyone was okay, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, the lead up to Helene was much different than that. There was mm-hmm. not nearly as much prediction of, of damage. There was not the alarmism associated with it. Um, but um, the, the, the downpours and the flooding that hit North Carolina... Tennessee, to some extent, I think Virginia, um, were 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 essentially essentially black swan events. Matt Kibbe yeah. actually pointed out to me, and I had not realized that those th- that type of flooding had not happened since the '60s. Mm-hmm. This is not; these are not communities that are preparing for hurricanes, right? Mm-hmm. They're you know, these are these are uh, party communities, but these are not a hurricane and hurricane related flooding because it is in distant memory is not something that they're spending a whole lot of time on. So Helene was a little different, a lot less fanfare leading up to it, probably leading to fewer people taking precautions. And then right before the extensive flooding in that area of the country, I think you, you kind of heard a heightened, a heightened concern from the news and from meteorologists, but really hitting communities that, that had not seen this kind of devastation in a long time. And the, the, the information coming out of there is just absolutely devastating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and I believe if I recall correctly, man, maybe you, you're not familiar. I, I'm pretty sure that area from uh, the you know Helene, like North Carolina, uh, Tennessee, that kind of region had also experienced a big, uh, almost a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for, a, a, sh- a shitload of rain essentially prior to even this. So it, their ground was already super duper saturated. Like they had received way more rainfall than they had in a long period of time already before the hurricane had even reached them. So, I mean, and anyone who's familiar with like the mountains uh, of like, cause I'm, I'm originally from Tennessee uh, and uh, you know, cause I, I was like 30 minutes away from people in the mountains. I had friends who lived in the mountains that, you know, like in UC, like if that play that, that some of those roads through there, the, the communities that you see in the mountains, it doesn't take a lot to, you know, it doesn't take a lot of uh, running through your brain to figure out how this will wreck wreak havoc on them. If there's a ton of rain uh, and wind, um, which I mean, they, they experience some wind and rain throughout the years, but not like that. Uh, and so it, it, I guess I'm not that surprised, but it is kind of one of those things that like no one really expected. So as you said, it was a black swan event. So it is, uh, logistically speaking, like how do we really plan for these? Um, everyone wants to criticize the government response, and uh, there probably is something to that. I guess, I guess maybe this would be a good time to kind of juxtapose 
uh, the the uh, Helene uh, fallout in kind of the uh, Appalachian type areas, and then against kind of what is going on with Milton right now in Florida, which obviously Florida pretty damn quick. While it, we did get rocked, they we came quickly uh, back from this. Now, I guess obviously I would I would assume Florida's you know more used to this. I just kind of your thoughts, maybe juxtaposing the two. Is there something Florida is also doing better in so far as? How they handle it is it just as federalized as those areas or or is there something i'm missing from like a emergency management type perspective no i think that florida has you know for for many decades if, if not before been more prepared for hurricanes um that that certainly changes the the complexity of their hurricane related planning they're planning for things like storm surge for flood for straight line winds and for tornadoes um, and while the same can be certainly applied in, in Tennessee and North Carolina, you know, the extent to which they are planning for, for other things probably greatens, right? And, and part of my research is really around, <laughs> are they planning? And, mm -hmm. and are, they, are they more worried about meeting some, some federal guidelines? Um, or are they actually working with their local communities, with their neighborhoods, with their HOAs to properly plan? And I think there's a big question mark over that. And that, that extends to not only Florida, but, but everywhere else as well. Yeah, I, I guess the question is just kind of, is Florida more or less federalized? Or is it just a matter of that we are instinctively just kind of know how to deal with this and that's all there is to it, really? I didn't know if there's anything more to it. Just I guess if you're already pre uh, prepared for it, it's kind of, it is what it is. Uh, you mean, what, what do we really need? I mean, a federal government for anyways in a, mm -hmm. an area like this where I'd say most of the stuff is just almost autonomic where people are just kind of handling. I don't know. Maybe the federal hands are involved, but they're not really necessary in an area like this anyways. So, yeah, I think that's the case. And I think, you know, to, to some extent, DeSantis has has um, exhibited that Florida attitude of, you know, we, we don't necessarily need you. We don't necessarily want you. And, and, and you know, to be clear, though, this is not to say the federal government has not had a hand in funding uh, disaster relief, uh, and certainly in funding uh, everything that comes before disaster in terms of emergency management and homeland security efforts uh, in Florida. There is plenty of money that pours in from the federal government into Florida, but I think the attitude of the people are, you know, been there, done that. We've seen plenty of storms, especially, you know, if I recall over the last 20 years, plenty of, plenty of huge storms uh, in Florida. So I think the people are used to it. Uh, and I think right now, at least, you have a governor whose attitude is, you know, we we can handle the the bulk of those things here, but 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 certainly the money still still flows into Florida for disaster relief. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I, I know you're of the. I mean, I guess correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just kind of curious. I guess just kind of an identity game here. Would you consider yourself along the lines of like ANCAP or Minarchist, something like? I'm just curious where you fall along these lines. Uh, cause I'm just, I, you know, I, I do have a follow-up question after that, uh, just out of curiosity, where roughly are you on the line? Obviously I know you're politically involved and might, there might be some dorks out there like, well, you're not a real anarchist, but I don't know. I, you, you, I, you, I know what you mean when you say I'm not of that brand. Uh, but, uh, point being just generally speaking, just kind of where do you fall or would you, are you an, an I mean, obviously like, are you an ANCAP or are you a minarchist? Like, do you believe there is a proper role for government or ultimately it, it, everything would be handled better free of coercion? Or is there some coercion necessary somewhere in your opinion? There is, there is zero question in my mind, Jose, and this is exactly what sent me in, into the, the research that I ended up doing in grad school. There is zero question in my mind that this could be handled better in the absence of government. Mm -hmm. from, that, from that perspective, yeah, I, I, I do consider myself an ANCAP um, with, without question, and on this specific question of emergency management, I I, I certainly don't I don't uh, make any exception for that, okay. and and that's because, um, you know the the FEMA response is and what it is capable of has been laid bare in Appalachia, and while maybe it has functioned better in the past in other places or worse in the past in in other places, its its reputation, um, while more widely known now for its failures from my perspective, working in emergency management in, in local kind of and state affairs, it, the, the, the response that FEMA can manifest often mm -hmm. has stood in the way of proper response. Um, do you recall the picture of the buses from Hurricane Katrina? Vaguely. Do you, Vaguely. Do you remember that? It was like a picture of buses and they were just sitting in floodwaters. And, and the story mm -hmm. there is that FEMA had contracted with a local bus company to move out um, people who needed to evacuate. 
and they simply failed to be able to manifest any action on that contract. And that's that's one small example. I get that, but there are numerous examples. Katrina is kind of a, a, an absolute um, perfect scenario for this. We're taking a look at the federal government and, and seeing that they stood only in the way of the private sector response. You know, the private sector attempting to ship supplies in, and FEMA standing in the way of that. And now that is reflected also, I think, in their their time in in um, Tennessee and North Carolina. You're hearing these reports, mm -hmm. I'm sure that they are um, blockading areas, that they are um, commandeering supplies, uh, and and that and then in many places where they say they are going to be, they they simply are not. I don't. Are, are you familiar with? So Sarah Higdon mm -hmm. writes for Human Events and Free the People, and she just um, published her report from a, a week or so of her time in that area, and she said that. Um, I have some I have some notes here because I wanted to share these things with you. So she said in her entire time there, she came across two FEMA representatives protected by two ATF agents. And she said she stopped at every location listed on the Blue Ridge public radio website where FEMA was supposed to be located. They simply weren't there. So in terms of whether or not the government has some role to play, I would venture a guess um, that 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 privatization, that communities coming together, more than anything, not having a fake understanding of what the government is capable of in terms of what you what you should prepare for in your home in your neighborhood, right? Not being set up for failure, not feeling, well, FEMA's gonna come, well, the the, the locals are gonna come, well, the state agency is gonna come. In the absence of that incentive, where there's going to be money for you at the other end of the of the rainbow, I think that people would plan better. I think communities can do it better. And, and privatization, you know, across the country in certain locations, they have um, public safety answering points. So 911 centers are privatized. Mm -hmm. There's privatized security. There's privatized firefighting. There can absolutely be privatized services for debris management. Uh, and, and and for the management of disasters without question yeah um i almost want to ask you the the normie question of like oh well if government wasn't involved then how would we do this but then like as i'm thinking about it just like in my real life dealing with this hurricane it's just such a stupid fucking question because you know like actually having dealt with this and, and not, i'm not saying i'm in some an emergency situation like i actually need to be evacuated by like helicopter or anything like that but generally speaking that's almost never the case but you know so far as normal day-to-day -day, you know or, or normal i guess somewhat you know disaster relief everything's pretty much economically already incentivized all the things you need so the big things were power which is ran through power companies which obviously you know mean you would probably have some issues with the government regulation that comes in play there which essentially causes those companies to cartel uh, almost create like cartels which but anyways you know i could go on but point being is it's a slightly more privatized mechanism uh so they are slightly incentivized to try to get us our power back because they know we're probably going to be fucking upset and they may lose money if they we don't have power uh and then when it comes to gas obviously these people want to sell gas if anything uh, you know, one of the things that does frustrate me is I always hear people talking about oh, how great it is that how they have these gouging laws because there are, I guess there are some laws in uh, Florida or in some areas where during hurricanes uh, you know they're not able to gouge it too much I'm like I don't know I'd actually would prefer the gouging to be honest uh, yeah. you know it it would control the supply and make it so people are only getting what they need but anyways I digress my whole point is like all the things I run through in my head of like actual things that are of any use in in these situations are all econ economically incentivized that there's not really even a role for a government to play in that. Aside yeah. from the crazy example where if I'm sitting on a, on my roof and I'm, I need a helicopter to come get me because it's flooded. Like, yeah. I don't know. I guess at that point, sure, yeah, you're probably going to need to get... There, I, it's no longer to be as economically incentivized and you may need to get the government involved. But even then, that's because we're in a current situation where the government exists. And so that money's been allocated elsewhere. But anyways, I'm droning on. I, I guess I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. It's just kind of like how these this would actually work in a, in a, in a you know, a, in a government free society. Uh, it, but the more I think about it, the more ridiculous of a question it is, because every area knows what goes on there. And most of these things, there's not really a role for government to play anyhow. So what are they really doing aside from coming in and, 
you know, trying to give people money after the fact. What, what like, what do they even do? Yep. Like, yeah. <laughs> let me, let me, can I, I want to answer this in two ways. I want to tell you what the success stories are right now coming out of mm -hmm. Appalachia. Uh, and then we can talk a little bit about what, em, what the emergency management function looks like on a, on a local level. What are they actually doing? That's a, a, an excellent question. So the stories coming out of North Carolina and Tennessee look like, have you seen Shane Hazel and what the Bitcoin veterans uh, are, are doing there? He's been there. It seems, it seems like he's been there since the storm hit with a series of colleagues. I just saw a tweet from him. I know he, it seems like he's working with an organization also called the Christ Rangers. They are doing incredible work, caring for people, making sure people are fed, bringing important medical supplies, um, Sarah Higdon also wrote about a place called Ford Operating Base Savage, where special forces members have joined together volunteer medical personnel, civilian helicopter pilots, uh, and they're, they're managing supplies. They're caring for people. They're, they're making sure that if there are medical needs, there are those well, you needs. You can throw out my helicopter example, too. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, right. So, so your helicopter example is an exemplary one for two reasons, right? So first civilians are nailing this mm -hmm. when they're allowed, because, you know, the, the FAA absolutely regulates airspace and, and there is always conflict between kind of what, what the federal government says is permitted and what has been permitted in terms of civilian aircraft. That's been a huge tension that we've seen. I've seen that play and I'm, you know, that's, that's not kind of an area of expertise for me. That would be a good, a good thing to talk to my husband about, but that's not, um, you know, that is a tension right now between uh, private aircraft and federal opportunity to, to regulate. Right. And so your, op, your example is a good one and it can be done by civilians. And we know that because it's being done right now. Our church is down there right now. Our church is down there right now. And I want to get this right, Swanona, in that area of North Carolina, where our pastor and his wife are from. Our pastor's wife, her church that she grew up in has been absolutely obliterated. And our church has sent down 20 people to serve in that area. So in terms of what are people willing to do? Well, we know that people are willing to drive. Our church is in Delaware. So people are willing to drive from Delaware to North Carolina to take care of Americans. And that is far more effective and far more meaningful uh, and, and does, does more for the longevity of, of how we can deal with disaster, right? Learning to care for each other like that, building those habits, building that expectation for faith-based organizations and nonprofits. That does more for us than any federal response could ever do. But also, so I said I was going to answer this in two parts. So that's the what that's the those are the success stories, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Shane Hazel and his team, Sarah Higdon being down there, so people people kind of in 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 our circle, even being down there serving people. That's those are the success stories. But you also asked an important question, and this is something I spent a long time thinking about. What? do emergency managers do? Now, the emergency manager is generally assigned to like a town or a county or a state, and they're responsible for a series of emergency plans that prepares their jurisdiction for whatever there is risk, right? Wherever there is risk. So for Florida, they're preparing for hurricanes, right? Tornadoes, things like that. But in, in I, I was so curious about how my colleagues were handling um, the huge, th their expectations to plan and a huge intake of federal funds after the merger of the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA. And this move away from planning for natural disasters and this move toward all what they called all hazard planning, which just means we're also going to like plan for Al-Qaeda here in the U.S. <laughs> So local emergency managers are responsible for planning, but they're doing this almost solely with federal funds. The, the survey responses to, to the, the, the survey that was launched nationwide were overwhelmingly that we wouldn't even have local emergency management. We wouldn't even be drafting plans if it weren't for federal money. And when I take a look at that, that statement, that overwhelming response from emergency managers, what I think I learn is that if you aren't a priority for your local government, if you aren't a priority for your local community, maybe you're not a priority. And that calls into question then even the local government role in disaster response. So we know that there, 
largely dependent on these huge federal grants. And I'm not talking like $10,000 here and there. I'm talking like a very small county of about 100,000 people in the aftermath of 9-11, circa like 2004, 2005, getting $500,000 in DHS funds. Just like here, take them, do whatever you want, <laughs> right? Like, and, and so, you know, I've talked a lot with Matt also about budgets mm -hmm. and I realized that that's not like a, mm -hmm. that's not a compelling story. Like who cares, right? About the funding. So let me- It matters warn... though. I, I mean, I, I don't know if you know my background. I'm, uh, I did 11 years active duty. Uh, so like I, I understand. And I remember when you, when I went through like supervisor school, whatever they teach you about how they work the budgets. Cause assuming at one day you, you might be like a senior NCO running, doing budgets or something like that. Uh, so they're, they're kind of prepping you for that. And the way it works is every, every, you know, however it's quarterly or yearly, I forget if you don't use that money, it goes away or, or, or you might be subject for it to go away. Yep. Uh, and so the, everyone's incentivized in each individual unit to use up the extent of their budget. And if anything, try to make requests to use extra that way it shows, Oh, we need more money than we use. But in reality, you, you, when you're in units, you know, there's plenty of times where you come to the end of the year and you're like, Hey, what do you guys, we need to buy some stuff. We need to buy some stuff. We need to buy. And it is, yep. it, it's a, and if you really think about it then and think about this in a big brain way, incentives, it literally is a, cancerous apparatus at that point like all it's gonna do is grow yeah and i promise you it is the same in local and state government mm -hmm. emergency management and homeland security and and those efforts are not even to just spend down local dollars right that came from local taxpayers is but to spend down everyone else's dollars as well right that got shipped in by the federal government so that is uh it's it's causing a lot of problems and i'm you know i i you know there's not like a scientific way to assess whether or not in Appalachia, the problems that I can cite from my own research are part of the lack of response. But again, I can tell you, you know, there are these, these small shop emergency management organizations are largely federally funded. And that tells me there's not a local priority placed on emergency management if they're letting the federal government do the work, right? But there is there is something a little a little more insidious, and that's that they certainly should, you know, if, if there is a local govern, government emergency manager, they certainly should be planning with neighborhoods, with homeowners associations, thinking about risk, thinking about mitigation measures, thinking about response and evacuation procedures, where we're going to shelter people, how we'll feed them. And I guess they're maybe doing some of that. But largely, they are doing the bidding of the federal government because in, in response to the survey, they told us that they, they deprioritize their local needs so that they can receive federal funds. And what, what that means is that they are doing what the federal government wants them to do. And I want to talk a little bit about what that is, because I think we can, I've, I've picked some, some things to talk about that I think you'll be interested in. So they deprioritize local needs. So, so in Florida, for example, they're like not thinking about hurricanes. Um, because they're busy meeting federal grant guidelines. And, mm -hmm. and some of those guidelines, you just talked about the training you sat through mm -hmm. in your career in the military. Some of those guidelines are exactly that. They are yep. sit through some classes. Are you familiar with the National Incident Management System? Incident no, but system? just to just to give you, a, I, I get what you're saying about the training. That's not even a half of it. I, I believe your your husband may have been a, vet, a, a prior military as well. I, I maybe yes, I'm wrong. Yes. So he yeah. probably I don't know when he got out, but uh, yeah, the there is a ton of training that you know any military member, which I think is just a government employee thing in general. It's not even a really like a military thing. I mean, obviously the it's gonna be more tailored for what training we get. Yep. Uh, but there becomes there's sexual assault training, there's survival training, there's uh, don't kill yourself training. There's, you know, like, and like each one of these is either a computer based clickety click, take some tests, or you actually have to go sit and listen to some supervisor that, you know, is just reading some script that, you know, and it, essentially it's all just bullshit contrived made yep. work, uh, that anyone in a smaller organization would go, why are we doing this? This is wasteful. This is stupid. Uh, but when you're a large organization trying to check a box to fit some sort of larger agenda, yeah. then it then it somehow makes sense. <laughs> so this is what your emergency managers have been doing. They have been shuffling all of your other 
response organizations through something called National Incident Management System Training. So taking all the cops, taking all the firefighters, taking all the paramedics, the hazmat technicians, and so on, and filtering them through these federal requirements because you cannot operate with federal grants unless everyone has met these requirements. And so I wanna give you some, some anecdotes about how successful this training has been. So in the Uvalde uh, school incident, one of the um, one of the implications of the huge report that has been put out since that incident was that the chief was on site and he had no idea what he was doing. He did not take command for that incident, which is specifically a dictate of kind of a, a higher level officer and a subject matter expert. He did not take command of the incident in Uvalde, which probably contributed to a delayed response into the school. Despite being the only person in Uvalde that took this training. So he had his emergency manager like spending their time ushering all his cop, you know, ushering him into training, trying to like pull his cops into training. He was the only person who attended and he still failed in this one duty, right? So this is what your emergency manager is doing. It's like running people through some training they're not listening to, and then some kids are gonna get shot up. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. And in fact, in that report, they have they they cite him saying he did he he said I did not issue any orders, which tells me that his training failed. Which tells me that his emergency management team, whoever was responsible for rolling out that training, failed. Which tells me that they're spending time on things they 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 have no business spending time on. So if you're wondering what your emergency managers are doing, it's that you know for emergency management nationwide. The federal government had a hand in building out these huge, elaborate, technologically advanced emergency operation centers. They are there for um, not just natural hazards, but man-made hazards as well. So emergency operation centers are activated in counties and states when there's a hurricane, tornado, when they need to evacuate, when they need to shelter, when there is... Um, you know, they would be stood up for nuclear power incidents, for issues of terrorism, and certainly for things like a school shooting. But let me read to you from the report of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas school shooting. Um, the, the report told us that because neither the emergency, sorry, neither the municipal emergency operations center in Parkland, nor the county emergency operations center in Broward County were fully utilized despite being activated. So emergency managers are, <laughs> are sending people through training who don't get it, kids get shot up, and emergency managers are activating their elaborate, technologically advanced, largely federally funded emergency operation centers, and no one is even deferring to them for, for direction during school shootings. So I, th those are two incidents. Those are certainly not, those are not natural disasters, but that is an example of how federal funding for emergency management is being used and is failing and certainly mm -hmm. does not lead us down a road where we are wanting more government in emergency management. Yeah, you've kind of, uh, you've confirmed most of my suspicions on probably what they're doing anyways. Cause I mean, I think all it really takes is someone, um, someone who I guess maybe is a little bit of a critical thinker who has a different opinion, working a little bit in government and you realize the mentality of the of these these organizations. That is the exact same thing uh, the military would do. It is, you see people, you see, uh, higher level NCOs that, you know, are like, I guess, kind of like mid-level management, essentially, who start creating positions and stuff like that. This, this yeah. is a common thing you see in government jobs where you're like, well, I really think we should have someone who handles this. Oh, 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 now, oh, wow. Now that's a new position and that's now in the budget. Oh, now this, this, this now we need a team for this position. Uh, and, and the next thing you know, it's a unit and it just, it goes on and on and on and they will continue to find, you know, an excuse to spend your money because they have no incentive to do otherwise you know, essentially, other than your complaints. Um, I guess uh, the question, though, becomes what what do we do from here? Uh, is this just a is there any sort of wiggle? I mean, are, are the states, you know, kind of vary a lot in their levels of federalization? Or are there better states to go to? Are there, you know, is there things we can do? Is it really just come down to just be prepared yourself and just kind of accept the fact that you're going to get a ton of your money stolen for frivolous things anyways? Like, wh where do we go from here? Yeah, 
No, it's it's a good question, right? What are what are the solutions? And there aren't there aren't perfect ones right now because we know we were, we don't have you know we don't have it in this lifetime to dismantle this entire system. So so there are a couple of opportunities, and the the first is absolutely right to be prepared in your home, uh, to to extend that preparedness maybe to your neighborhood and to your neighbors, and to understand what assets you have, what assets they have. Uh, because if we're serious about preparedness, really, we're not we're not waiting on government to do that, right? Especially especially people kind of in the liberty movement, we are mindful of those things. We're not just thinking about hurricanes, but we're thinking about kind of when when the shit hits the fan, <laughs> what do we need to have for our families? So we're already doing that, but rolling that out to your neighborhood is a good idea. Asking your neighbors to think about that too uh, is a, is a wise idea. But I am I am very involved in the defend the guard effort. Um, mm-hmm. And the Defend the Guard effort does two, two things that are incredibly important. And, and once, once successful in one state, I am, I am absolutely convinced other states are going to follow. So it both strikes a blow at the military industrial complex, right? By giving a governor the power to say, no, Congress has not declared war. So you cannot have my National Guard units because they're going to be here in case they're their, their fellow, in case their neighbors need them, is the bottom line. So it does that, right? It kind of strikes a blow, strike, strikes a blow at, at the um, kind of the, the war machine and its want to, to send American sons and daughters o- overseas. So it, it provides the governor that opportunity. But by being home, we have trained, locally positioned people who can respond very quickly to natural disasters. And when they do, in my experience working with them, they do a phenomenal job. Those guys are no bullshit. They, they come in, they do a job, they're well-trained. And so if we can keep them home, if we can keep them out of foreign undeclared and unconstitutional wars, the Defend the Guard Act, um, if passed in states does provide an opportunity, I think for quick or local response. Now that's still a government, that, yeah. that's government response still, right? But, but it is an improvement from the perspective of local response not sending people overseas to to fight undeclared wars, you know, and and I think the the uh, the other opportunity we have is to push local governments to reduce their dependency on federal grants. That is a long haul. Mm-hmm. Local governments are are absolutely addicted uh, and overwhelmed with the intake of federal grants, and it's not just an emergency management. The DOJ grants to local police departments and sheriff's offices are astronomical. They pay for um, overtime so they can sit and run radar, um, which is absurd. Why a federal government grant should be responsible for staffing and oper- for kind of general staffing and operations is absolutely insane. But they come attached to the same types of compliance and requirements and the same types of kind of dependent relationships that we see. So in terms of solutions, again, you know, getting people who are liberty minded, you know, I, I bet these problems aren't as bad in New Hampshire. How about yeah. that? Getting people who are liberty minded, thinking about reducing the, the, their dependence on federal grants is, is also an opportunity that we have. Yeah. Um, I guess this kind of dovetails into your, uh, your defend the guard, but I did think it was an interesting point that in the midst of Helene and Milton, we're also dealing with a, I don't know, a almost borderline meme level ridiculous money grab when it comes to Ukraine and Israel, uh, just constant, here's money, here's money, here's money. Um, I, and then we have, you know, obviously it's, while I while we've kind of made the point that we don't really necessarily even want the government help here, but if you're going to be giving help, it's it's a little bit of a slap in the face to you know tell people up in North Carolina here's 750 bucks. Oh, here you go, Israel. Here's a few more million. Uh, it just while maybe we could make the case that you know I don't know maybe they don't need that 750 and we shouldn't just be pulling money out of thin air. Uh, it's still kind of like, I don't know, when you juxtapose that against spending money for literal wanton death, uh, it is, it's a little bit, it, it stings a little. And, and I get where kind of our lefty people out there that kind of have this, you know, when it say when it comes to healthcare, emergency management, just, or just people who like government in general, I get where they're coming from, uh, where they make this point of like, hey, you know, you're spending your money over here. Why don't we spend it over here? Fair point. I, I would take that trade. Uh, I just, I don't know. It's kind of your thoughts on that. Um, and I guess... That, like I said, that does tie into defend the guard. So if you want to use that as a, you know, to talk about that a little bit more, that'd be great. I'm I'm a realist, Jose. I would take that trade any day. 
Yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't begrudge some homeowner in North Carolina, $750 right now. My God, yeah. I pray they get it. I, I, <laughs> I'm not sitting around counting my, my, you know, my, my taxes last year, wondering what some homeowner in, in North Carolina is going to end up with and not even remotely. Uh, but I do think about it with respect to the new $400 million package for Ukraine and the ongoing funding for, for Israel and, um, Sorry, I have gnats. <laughs> so did you did you know that this this matter of how we treat Israel extends into disaster management? No, I didn't. I'm gonna tell you how. This is okay. ridiculous. I took this note too because I wanted to share this with you. So so in the state of Texas, if you look back in the documentation, and I could not tell you the year, but I think it's in like the last decade, Hurricane Harvey, the disaster relief aid in Texas was tied to a couple of things. You could not contract with a company who has or does not agree to never, that's a double negative, boycott Israel. So even our disaster funding at the state level, and I'm sure it extends past Texas, right? And in fact, I am at some point, the Florida state government had a comparable um, yeah, boycott I mean, and you're um, probably right. Yeah, best, yeah, yeah. had a, had a comparable policy, yeah. but but it's I don't like know almost that that every was... state. I think BDS uh, bans yeah, are almost that, a thing. Yeah, it, so... it's it's one of those things. That I I don't know. I I can't not mention it. It's just such an insulting thing that there's just one. There's a whole series of legislation for an assortment of states out there, damn near the whole nation, uh, that a certain country, for some reason, people aren't allowed to organize and make voluntary decisions to not buy this country's products. Yeah, it's insane. And the fact that disaster <laughs> relief funding for yeah. local governments in Texas after a hurricane were tied to this. Yeah. Absolutely. You, you saw what Lindsey Graham tried wanted to do, right? Which Which thing? Oh, okay. The the thing I think this was after Helene. He was, uh, and this was, um, this was right in the midst of Iran, uh, I believe, attack. Uh, you know, um, in response, essentially responding to Israel's uh, flagrant uh, incursions on them. Uh, they uh, they bombed um, Tel Aviv or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And this was right after that. Lindsey Lindsey Graham was saying that you know, oh, these North Carolinians, you know, because I think he's a Virginia North. Or oh yeah, yeah. He's like they need a uh, they need the they need support, uh, and so do our friends over in Israel. And so he was proposing to put forth a bill to for relief, but to tie it to to Israel aid, which is just like gross. <laughs> what an absolute pig! Yeah. Yeah. What an absolute. There there aren't harsh enough words for Lindsey Graham. Um, and I saw recently he was encouraging Ukraine to recruit younger service yep. members. So yep. that's 18 fun to 25. too. Yeah. Yep. There aren't, there aren't, there's not a, a harsh enough, yeah, there, there aren't harsh enough words for Lindsey, yeah. Lindsey Graham. Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you off. I just, no, I, I no, that's okay. <laughs> no, yeah. the fact, honestly, the fact that these things, these things are not separate, right? Not just in terms of, are we giving dollars over to Americans or, or Ukrainians or, or other folks? Um, but but really, for, even from a disaster relief perspective, the expectation is you you bow to another another uh, nation's government. Mm -hmm. And I think a key point for you know, especially since we're kind of tying this into uh, kind of our philosophy of libertarianism is, uh, I think when it comes to economics, it's a lot about allocation because people think like, oh well, oh we're doing this, and we're doing that. It's like okay, but like money's being allocated over here, and like yeah, sure, theoretically we could just print all the money in the world, but. Their value has to come from somewhere, so you are pulling value from one to the other. So, I mean, to to prevent people being in the guard, whether or not the guard itself ends up actually taking an active role in emergency management, at the very least, that you know clears up funds that would go elsewhere. Whether they are manually diverted by some individual is isn't the point. It's the seen and the unseen. It's the idea that now this value has the opportunity to go somewhere else because it's not being squandered elsewhere. So yeah, the yeah. the guard is a really good example, right? Because at the the moment that the Defend the Guard Act passes, and even one state. You know the the threat has always been, and the reason that legislators are are loath to pass the bill, well, they're going to pull our federal funding, mm -hmm. and that is um, that, you know, that that yeah that should tell you everything you need to know right there. That is only about money, right? And at this point, it's monopoly money anyway. 
right? Yeah. So no one, no one is actually even thinking about the the repercussions of of spending. But but yeah, I think that's that's evident, kind of even in our defend the guard story. Mm -hmm. Well, all right, I've kept you long enough. I know you got a family to go back to, as do I. Uh, if you could let my audience know where they can find you, uh, you know, kind of what you're working on, uh, kind of go over that again. Uh, whatever, whatever you want to promote, uh, you know, feel free. Now's your time. You got it, Jose. Thank you. So, so folks should follow at Dissident Media. Uh, I'm I'm a little active on Twitter, but I, I want people following Dissident Media, and I I can be found at at Archetypal Dork. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to my sponsors out there over at patreon.com. So no way Jose 2020, uh, the highest level. I read them off every episode. I'm my co-host on Taragang at Taragang Toad. I have at Abrogate D's at Z O V E R A C K at underscore infinite zeal. Then Jacob Daniel, the biblical anarchy podcast. He just uh, dropped a pretty good episode. I, I have it saved in my watch later, uh, response to Constantine Kissin. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Then the homie Tim Tuttle at Jolly on Klebold. And then Will Bell makes delicious blueberry rabbit eye wine. And then I got a new sponsor. He's a big fan of the show. We want to let you guys know this. At Real Josh Elliott. Go give him a follow for supporting me. And uh, for those on the lower end of Patreon, if you do want to support me, you do get episodes like this early. Uh, I try my best to try to stick on a pretty good release schedule. I'm a little thrown off with a hurricane right now. So sorry out there to patrons. I do appreciate you. You guys did help me get through this situation a little bit easier. So thanks for that. Uh, but yeah, and also on my weekly live streams with, with on already dead, you guys can come on as a talking head in the call in portion. Uh, so yeah, there's other perks as well, but if you want to support me, I appreciate that. You can follow me at tower gang, Jose, uh, with that. Yeah. Like, share, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Get this out there and with that. We are out.